Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 15. Um, in the previous lectures, we've talked about the static water, the effect of static water on the soil behavior. <clears throat> For example, we talked about how to find the groundwater table and uh, what's the meaning of it. So above the groundwater table, we have a capillary rise and below the groundwater table, the degree of saturation is 100%. So the pore water pressure or the water pressure increases from the level of the groundwater table. So <clears throat> we've seen how to compute the pore pressure. And from that, um, also we can compute the effective stress. And so to estimate the effective stress, we need to know the total stress, sigma, and the pore water pressure, u. And from that, we can compute the sigma prime. So now, <clears throat> that uh, we know how to compute the total stress and pore water pressure and the effective stress at a certain depth of interest. So for that, we need to know the density profile and we need to know the location of the groundwater table. Yep. And today in this lecture, now the water is not moving. Uh, it's, it will move. It's not static anymore. So, for example, here we have a dam that's blocking the water. And here's the upstream, and this is the downstream. So in the upstream, you have a water reservoir so that you have a higher water table. And in the downstream, because it flows down, you, have a, uh, you will have the lower water table. So then, because of this height, chain, height difference between upstream and downstream, water will flow. Right, through the soil underneath the dam. So then the question will be, what will be the pore pressure here? And the effective stress at this, with this moving water. Right? So pore pressure, so then we can estimate the effective stress. And the other question will be, uh, what will be the flow rate that's passing underneath the dam. Surely it's gonna be affected by this height difference between the um, upstream and the uh, downstream. So if you have a bigger height difference, the water table water level is very high and the other uh, the other end you have a very low, then the, the flow rate will be high. If the water level are similar to each other, then you don't have uh, the flow rate will be very slow. So they we're going to talk about this kind of a problem in on the, the next three lectures. Another example is the excavation site. So here, um, before we excavate, you may have a water and below that you have a maybe ground surface and you want to block the water first and then you want to excavate. to install some um, pile or uh, the structure. So then because of the uh, water, di water level difference, the flow always flow, uh, the water, water always flows from a higher level of energy to the lower level of energy, right? So high energy to the low energy state. So then uh, surely you can see that the, uh, this is the lower level ground and this is the high level water table. So the water will flow like this. So kind of you have an inflow going into the excavated surface. So then what's the flow rate of this one? How fast it flows? And what will be the effective stress state here? What's the pore water pressure and total stress and the effective stress? What about here? If the water doesn't move, you can compute the uh, total stress and pore water pressure and the effective stress. But while the water is moving downward, what happens to the pore water pressure? Will it be the same or different? So that's what we're going to talk about in the next, the, including this lecture and next three lectures.
Okay, so before we talking about that, <clears throat> we need to learn some governing relations for water flow in soils. The first one is the incompressible water assumption. So that means that the water density at 4 degrees Celsius, water density at 20 degrees Celsius, water density at um, 30 degrees Celsius is not that different each other. So we can assume it's constant water density. So no change in water density at ordinary stress level and the temperature level. So stress level here is also the pressure. So the water density at one kilometer deep or the water density at the surface of the water is not that very different. So that's our assumption here. And it is actually doesn't uh, differ that much. And the second uh, governing relation is the uh, laminar flow. So let me use the blue pen. And flow is laminar. So you may have taken the uh, um, fluid mechanics class. And uh, we, then you will be familiar with the concept of the turbulent and the laminar flow. Uh, let me give you an example. So, for example, you have a pipe or tube filled with water. And here, the, your, this is the water level. And you're pouring the water so that you're uh, keeping the constant water table level. And then, uh, this is the outflow. So the, the outlet water level or the height is at this level. So then height difference is about this much. And because of this height difference, water will flow from you no know, higher energy state to the lower energy state. Right? And then the flow of this water, the water flow will have a certain velocity. And this velocity will be affected by this h. If the h is gets lower, then v will go down the velocity. So the, the speed of the water flow will be lower. If the h increases, then the velocity also increases. And this h is indicate uh, h indicates the energy difference between the inlet and the outlet. So here again, the I is called the hydraulic gradient. And hydraulic gradient is defined as the head difference delta H over delta L. For a certain distance, what's the energy level difference? Huh? So the hydraulic gradient. We call it hydraulic gradient. And we use this kept small letter I. And the definition is delta H over delta L. And uh, we're going to define this delta H later. Um, so basically, as the, uh, the height increases, the velocity increases. And that's the, you know, between these two, the relation is linear. So it kind of uh, increases linearly, proportional to each other. So if as the I increases, the velocity increases. And with the, uh, uh, as you keep increasing the, uh, the height or the hydraulic gradient, it, the velocity will increase, but it's not linear anymore. So here's some transient phase where the velocity increases slower than the, uh, the increase, increasing rate of the hydraulic gradient. And then it gets much slower and slower. And the reason is that when you have uh, too much high flow rate, so the velocity of the water flow is too high, then the, you get the turbulent flow. So you, you can have some back flow, right? And it's not, it's not going like straight anymore. It's called a turbulent. But so uh, depending on the uh, uh, velocity regime and the uh, hydraulic gradient, we can divide into three regions, the laminar region, and turbulent region and the other extreme. And between, we have a transient region where the flow behavior 
transition uh, shows the transition from laminate to turbulent. So normally we analyze the flow behavior behavior in the laminar regime. So water flow in soil is slow enough to be assumed in the laminar stage so that the, uh, the velocity or the flow velocity is proportional to the hydraulic gradient or energy difference. And this is fundamentally uh, the origin of the uh, Darcy's law that we're going to learn today later. Okay, <clears throat> and the third law is called the law of mass conservation or we call it continuity law. Um, so if you have a pipe that's closed and you have an inlet and outlet and if, if the uh, inlet area is A1 and the velocity going in is the V1 and the velocity going out is V2 and the area of the outlet is A2 then the Q in equals to Q out. So the, the volume of water going in is the same with the volume of water outflowing. And from here, uh, because the flow rate or the rate of discharge is V times A, so you can say V1 times A1 is V2 times A2. And this is the continuity law. So whatever they're going in is going to out, going to come out. And here um, the velocity, uh, sorry, the flow rate is we use the capital Q, and sometimes we use the term, the terminology rate of discharge, and the uh, unit is the volume per time. So it could be liter per second or the uh, cubic meter per second. And here velocity is meter per second, right? So length over time, and area is length square so that you no know, total it becomes the uh, cubic meter per second okay <clears throat> in the next page we're going to talk about the energy conservation law and i think some of you uh, remember what we learned maybe in the physics one or the uh, uh, high school physics bonulis equation so wherever the material or the mass is there, the energy is conserved. So the first one is the potential energy. And potential energy is m times g times he, if, it, if there is a, some elevation height. Then the kinetic energy is the second one when the, the mass is moving at a constant speed. And the kinetic energy is 1 over 2 times m times um, v, the velocity square. And the last one is the pressure energy. And here the pressure energy is, you can think of the walk. So where the, you have a balloon and you have an air pressure. And if the air pressure um, increases the volume of the vol balloon by delta v, then that's the uh, work and energy that the uh, air pressure did. So E pressure, pressure energy is P time volume of the, uh, um, the fluid. So in total, MGHE, which is the potential energy and kinetic energy and pressure energy. And this is constant. And here finally we have a hedge, we need to define the hedge. And hedge is another term of calling the energy in hydraulics. So here because the, the fluid, they only look at the water as the fluid. So here they just uh, convert the every energy term into the height of water. So height of water column in length dimension expressed, expressing the energy, energy level, and describe the energy of fluid and used only for water. Um, so the total energy is, tot, uh, sorry, total head, HT, is total energy 
divided by m and g. So then elevation head plus So this equation from here, if you divide it by m times g, then mg will cancel out so that you have only he left. And here m will go out, so v squared over 2 times g. And the last term pv is um, mg, and the m, if you know the density, then you can cancel, you can remove the v with the, um, the density value here, rho w. So, and this is also conserved. So you can say the HT, the total head, is conserved. Um, we call this term H is elevation head. And the second term is velocity head. And third term is called pressure head. And of course, you can um, replace the rho time g with the gamma w, the unit weight of water. <clears throat> so in general, um, head loss occurs in flow due to the friction. So for example, if there's no friction, then energy at the inlet will be the same with the energy at the outlet. In other words, total head at the point A will be the same with total head at point B. But in reality, if, if the water flows through the soil, then the, you have a head loss, which is caused by the friction. So the head loss means the energy loss. If this or the pipe is filled with soil, then flows through through the soil, and because of the friction between the soil grain and the water, you have a head loss. So in reality, uh, in the end, the total head at A is greater than the total head at B point. So here is the total head at A, and here is total head at B, and you have a head loss. If you count the head loss, then the, it will be conserved. So here HA, and the velocity at here is the VA, and the pressure at here is the PA, then this is the total head. And about the at B, velocity VB and the PB and the HB will give you the total head at B. And plus you need to consider the head loss. For most of flow problems in soil, V is small enough to be neglected. So we don't consider, we can consider, uh, we can assume that the velocity head is almost zero. So HT is AE plus, uh, HE plus HP, so elevation head plus the pressure head. So, you can express the total head with the elevation head and the pressure and gamma w. Okay. So remember here, the head loss occurs when it flows through soil. And okay. here the water. when water flows through the soil. Okay. <clears throat> the next topic that we're going to learn is called Darcy's Law. And Darcy's Law is very important in this uh, uh, when we analyze the water flow in soil. Okay, before we uh, derive the Darcy's law, let's do some thinking experiment. Um, parameters affecting the flow rate Q. So first one, area. So if you have a 
a pipe with a small area and a large area which will uh, result higher flow rate this one right so we can say that um, let me use the blue red one the flow rate will increase with the cross-sectional area linearly if we have a soil block which is about maybe like one meter and you have a shorter length of the soil block maybe 10 centimeter then which will uh, cause the higher flow rate because you know the here the soil pack is more length is the longer so that it will cause the more friction so the flow rate will be in this case it's going to be high and here it's going to be lower so again the flow rate will be inversely proportional to the, the length of the soil specimen and the head difference so here the between the inlet and outlet uh, when you have a high difference the high difference is big and the high difference is small surely in this case you have a higher flow rate so Q is proportional to the height difference or in other words head difference because head is an indicator to the energy level <clears throat> and when you have a clay pack that's blocking the, the pipeline here or the sand pack that's packed inside the pipeline which will uh, slow down the flow rate more clay so you can imagine that sand will have higher flow rate than the clay soil so also the flow rate is proportional to the uh, hydraulic conductivity so k actually here we need, we need to clarify the k sand is bigger than the k clay right so then um, if you look at these relations by combining all of that we can have k time l delta h and area so proportional to the flow rate is proportional to the area and the proportional to the head difference and proportional to the uh, um, hydraulic conductivity and inversely proportional to the uh, the length of the soil specimen and actually this is the Darcy's law so if I write it again Q is velocity time area, cross-sectional area and the V is K time I time A and here the I is hydraulic gradient so that's delta H over L and A and the K is called hydraulic conductivity or the coefficient of permeability and again the I is delta H over L and this is called a hydraulic gradient right so the Darcy who was uh, the French water work engineer showed that the velocity of water flow water water velocity is linearly proportional to the hydraulic gradient for the clean sand so that's the uh, actually uh, origin of the Darcy's law so he kind of suggested this equation that velocity is proportional to the hydraulic gradient and that there's a coefficient called k and k is is the soil property and we call it coefficient of permeability okay <clears throat> and then what properties or the what factors will affect the permeability so when you think about the soil the, uh, we've learned the particle size and pore size and species surface area and voids ratio and particle size distributions and 
etc., etc. And for the coarse grain soil, or it could be the fine grain soil too, um, these are the main factors affecting the permeability or hydraulic conductivity. So to decrease the permeability, particle size decreases. So as the particle size decreases, K decreases. Right? As the pore size decreases, also permeability decreases. So pore, the particle size decreases means that uh, you are going from gravel to sand, and sand to silt, and silt to clay, then the, you have a uh, reduction in permeability. And also it's re related to the pore size. What about the specific surface area? As the specific surface area goes up, then you have a more friction between the solid and the water. So K will go down. And void ratio, as you compact the soil more densely, then the void ratio goes down. So the permeability also goes down. Right. And what about the particle size distribution? As it gets more well graded, then the voyage ratio goes down, so the permeability goes down. As it gets more poorly graded, then K increases. All right. Okay. Um, for the last topic, we're going to talk about the how to measure this hydraulic conductivity or coefficient of permeability. Um, there are laboratory measurement method, and there are field testing method. Uh, for the lab test, there are constant head testing method and falling head testing method. And in the field, people uh, typically use the pumping well test and slug test. Um, in this class, we're going to learn about these two laboratory methods. Okay, so the first one is the constant head test. So the setup is very easy. So you have a soil sample here, and that's going to retain between the screen. So it, the volume doesn't change during the flow and during the test. And then you uh, maintain the uh, upstream, uh, the reservoir water level constant, and also you maintain the uh, lower reservoir water level constant. So then you're keeping the head difference or the water level height difference constant during the test. And then after a steady state condition is achieved, which means that the, uh, the water level doesn't change over time, so it's going to be kept constant with time. So then you measure the volume of water flowing out. So you measure the volume of water Vw collected in time t, then this gives you the flow rate q, that's the, the volume of water over time. Then using the, uh, the Darcy's law, q is kia, so kia, um, k time h over l and area, this is the uh, Darcy's law when you, when you uh, spell out, and here and this the flow rate is also measured, so Vw over T. So the unknown is this K, and we know the area of the specimen area, and H is also, we controlled it, and we know the length of specimen L. So, and we just measured this one. So K is the only unknown, and Vw L over T A H. And from this, you can compute the uh, conduct, hydraulic conductivity. The unit will be uh, meter per second. And just you know, the hydraulic gradient I has no dimension. So this is the length over length. So length over so it will cancel out so okay and the second method is called the falling head test 
And here, um, the the main difference is that you have a stand pipe with the smaller diameter, and you're measuring the velocity of the water height going down. So as you can see from the title, the head is changing with time during the test. And so the head is falling down, then you're looking at, you're measuring the how fast it's falling down. So H is changing. So then, so for example, in this uh, configuration, so you have a valve closed initially, and the inside is all fully saturated. So you have a water up to this part. And then when you open the valve, so when you open the valve here, then the water will go down. So then you're measuring the height at different height difference at a different time, T1 and T2. So velocity of fall in a standpipe is we can uh, express in this mathematical form. V is minus dH over dt. So H is changing. And from there, we can compute the uh, mm, inflow here. The flow rate in a standpipe. So minus A times dH over dt. So actually, this is the V time area. So V is here, and area is the, the small a. And outflow here for the large A, for the uh, cross-sectional area of the soil specimen, uh, will be Q out, and this Q in and Q out will be the same. So let's get the Q out first. That's the K and I and A, and K and H over L and A. Here the H is changing with time. So then, using the uh, continuity law, you can use these two equation and you can combine these two as so a minus a times dh over dt equals k times h over l times a so we have to solve this <coughs> differential equation then you know, you manipulating the um, the h the move it to the left side and dt to the right side and uh, put the integration so then a, you're, you're going to measure the uh, the head at time t1, which is h1. And if you measure the uh, head in water level height at t2, then that's going to be h2. And then from that, h2 or h1, if you do the integration for the h1 to h2, minus a time dh over a, h. And here also, you have constant and the dt. And you can solve it. Um, then you get this equation. So, <clears throat> from that, you can derive this equation. So, A time L time ln H1 over H2 over A time T2 minus T1. And this become you can simplify this one so just measure the uh, t uh, the head or the water level at t1 and measure the uh, water level at t2 then using that if you know the area of the stem pipe and uh, so specimen area and the length, then you can compute the K. Here, the important thing is that you don't need to measure the uh, flow rate or the collect the water. Before, you had to collect the water, right? So you have to collect the water to measure the flow, flow rate Q. But in the constant uh, no, the falling head test, falling head test, you don't need to collect the water. That's all. Thank you. I'll see you guys in lecture 16.